Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter, book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 15 and 16. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. The title of the message is Protect Your Testimony with Your Life. Protect Your Testimony with Your Life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Brother Jay, can you pray for the message? Amen. 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 Protecting your testimony with your life. And the Lord leads you, and Holy Spirit works in amazing ways. You know, we saw how, you know, we heard some testimonies today, especially from Brother Richard, Sister Tracy, and how they led people to the Lord. Those are possible because of the testimony that they carry. Each one of us carry our own testimony. Of course, you get saved. Your, your salvation testimony should be all same. In this room, if any of us have a different salvation testimony, then we need to check in our right away. Your te- salvation testimony should be simple, knowing that you are a, you are a sinner on your way to hell. You believe that Jesus Christ died for all your sins, and you trusted him, not in your life, but in your heart as your Lord and Savior. Then the Bible says you have eternal life. Simple as that. That should be everyone's testimony. Your testimony shouldn't be because, you know, I go to church, because I do good works, because I was baptized, because I'm speaking in tongues, you know, because I said Jesus in my dream last night. You know, those cannot be your testimony. Those are all salvation by works and by feelings, you know, and by, per- in this day and age, right, there are so many false doctrines out there where people will be deceived, and you know, people have been deceived. And for some, you and I, we have a testimony where we got out of that, you know, church or cult, wherever may be false doctrine, and found the truth by grace and mercy of God and truly gotten saved. You know how hard it is for people who grow up in you know, religions such as Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, Mormonism, even you know, strong Catholic, you, know, you name it, Buddhism, you know, all these religions. It's really hard, especially if you are brainwashed for years and years and years. But you should thank God that through it all, you know, Lord showed you truth, and you accepted the truth, and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you know for sure that, you should know for sure that you are going to heaven after you die. That's a great salvation testimony. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, my sins are washed away once and for all. And some people might be like, oh man, especially people who's listening, you know, we have this question a lot. Now, I do have a testimony of 
accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven or hell. They don't have assurance of salvation. Many times the reason being because you're living in sin. Amen. Another reason being you're studying and listening to wrong doctrines. Funny thing is that you know, after a person gets saved, usually the devil does his work right away. He sends someone. Sometimes you know, Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door like the day after or the same day. Or you know, those you know, Mormons come and they start talking to you about it, right? Or your close friends and family says, you know what, you know, how can you know for sure, right? Like those kind of, they put questions on your mind. Then you start, you know, getting confused. The reason being is that you do not have your final authority set on the Word of God. If your final authority is the Word of God, and if God says you're saved, then you're saved. Why do you have to listen to anyone else? Why do you have to listen to this call over there, this so-called, you know, you know, smart guy over there or smart girl over there? No, you only listen to God. You only listen to what the Bible says. You know, this is sure word than someone telling you that I heard from God that I'm saved. It's more sure word when someone tells you that in my dreams, Jesus Christ, you know, put a new heart in my heart. No. This is the most sure thing that you can base off of. That's why the Bible says, he that hath the Son has life, and he that hath not the Son of God has not life. Then if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you have eternal life. Even if you want to deny it, even if you don't believe it anymore, if once in your life you trust that Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, knowing that you are a sinner on your way to hell, believing that his blood can wash away all your sins, from bottom of your heart, you're saved. I mean, that's, that's the greatest gift ever. Even if you want to deny it now, maybe you're filled with the devil now. You're like, God, I don't want to go to heaven anymore. I mean, that's really, you know, stupid, right? God, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell with my family and my friends. He said, no, no, no. You know, your sins are already washed with the blood of my son. You're coming to heaven. I mean, praise the Lord for that. Because that's a testimony that you should have. There are so many forefathers of faith who protected their testimony and gave up their life. Think about the days of Inquisition, you know, dark ages, where everybody was, you know, dying, you know, through torture. I mean, even if you confess that Jesus is not Lord, they still killed you during those days. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, they did some horrible, terrible things. I mean, you should go read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And there's things that, you know, it's really hard to utter from the pulpit. What they did to pregnant women, what they did to children in front of their parents. Uh, the worst human imagination were put to work during those days. I mean, some of the things that you hear, probably you're going to puke. That's how terrible people die. However, when you read someone like John Knox's testimony, I mean, he was praising God, burning and praising God. Can you imagine? I mean, this morning, unfortunately, I got a paper cut, taking some stuff out, and man, you, it, you just feel it right away. You're like, ah. And you know how terrible it is? for those little paper cuts and as of, and think about these little burns, you know, those who cook here, you know, you're always gonna get hurt. You're cooking some meat, you're cooking anything, eggs or whatnot, you know, those hot oils gonna jump at you, you know, but, you know, thank God for mothers and fathers who cook, you know, you go through it, endure it, and it becomes a part of your life. However, you know, if any of the young ones start cooking for the first time, and they get hit by those, you know, hot oil, they start jumping, and they start screaming, oh, it hurts so much, it hurts so much. But imagine if your whole body is burning, your whole body, you know. If you ever talk to a burn victim, I mean, it's the most, 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 you know, horrible pain someone can endure. 
And people who have third degree, second degree, first degree burns in the hospitals, it hurts. It just hurts so much. But imagine, how can someone getting burned from head to toe can praise the Lord and singing hymns? Why? Because the Lord has given them grace and mercy because their testimony is the light to the world out there. How many people do you think when you see someone who was on the fence, okay, this guy proclaims Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord, and he's burning on the stake. I want to have what he has. Right? It's going to move people's heart. Imagine if some people like deny Jesus Christ and you're not going to die. And there are a lot of people who do because their flesh is weak. I deny Jesus Christ and they get their head cut, I mean, head chopped off, you know, at the guillotine. People are like, you know what? You know, if they can't die for what they believe in, I don't want it. So when you think about your testimony, you think about Lord Jesus Christ. Are you willing to protect your testimony with your life? It's not about time here, time there. It's not about day here, day there. It's not about year here, year over there. Anybody could put some time in, but are you willing to protect your testimony with your life? It's not something that you could answer lightly. And I don't want you to answer lightly. You have to look at your life. You, got, you have to look at, like the Bible says, you know, in all manner of conversation. You have to look at your behavior. You have to look at your manner of living. You have to look at your actual conversation. You have to look at your heart before you answer that question. Many people who say, it, oh, yeah, I could die for Jesus Christ right now, they're the one who's going to deny Jesus Christ right away because they're full of pride and they're, they want to be showy to people. In order to keep your testimony with your life, you have to keep guard your heart. You have to protect your heart. Many people, they have the, especially people listening and people in here, you have two things that a lot of people don't have in the first place. Besides from getting saved, right? You have the word of God. You have the perfect word of God, so that's good. And secondly, you have the right doctrine. So you have right doctrine, and you have the right word of God. Because some people have the right word of God, but they have the wrong doctrine, right? So you have two things that a lot of people don't have, right? Word of God, and you have the right doctrine. But you're, you're lacking one thing. You're lacking one thing. That's your action, your testimony, your conversation. You have two things. And a lot of times, because of these two things, you become very proud. Especially, that's one thing people you know, hate on or people feel like Bible-believing circle is you know, a bunch of you know, Bible thumpers who's like really proud. It's because there are some people like that out there. When knowledge gets into your head, it gets puffed up. And if you don't get careful, if you're not careful, what happens? You think you're that scholar. What do you think so many people who went to PBI, who went to Dr. Ruckman's church and to his school, they thought they're better than Dr. Ruckman. Suddenly, like, I know more than you, Doc. I could interpret this better than you, Doc. Well, I'm going to start my own college and show to people that I'm better than you. Because pride has gotten into them. So before you even go into your actions, you got to check your heart. Do I put down people or do I think that I'm better than others because I know truth? I mean, that is not a good testimony. I mean, when you're talking to people because you think you know more than them, there's a big difference when you're talking to people with true sincerity and love and charity, and so when you're talking to people, trying to show to them that you know more than them. Do you think good things come out when husband and wife, when, when a spouse start telling on the other spouse? Not with charity, but because, you know, you want to point out that you're better than them? There's no good ending to any of those relationships. 
right? And then God forbid, like a husband tells wife, right? So I know, I know calculus more than you. So let me explain to you how calculus works. <laughs> and the wife goes, let me tell you what the meaning of this vocabulary is, right? I was good at SAT, so I'm going to tell you what's the meaning of this hard words. What do you think people are going to feel? They'll be like, you know, just, just be quiet. I don't want to listen to you. But that's the attitude, and that's, time of the, that's the type of thing that you convey to other people when you're telling them about Jesus Christ, but you're doing it with such a pride, you're doing it with such a puffed up knowledge that they don't really understand, they don't really get the feeling that you're doing this because you love my soul. You're doing this because you just want to, you know, tell on me and show that you are better than me or you know more than me. That's a trap that a lot of Bible believers fall into. If you have gone through that road, you already know. If you haven't, you're going to. That's why you have to guard your heart. If you don't, what's going to happen? Your testimony will not be good. Your testimony, people aren't going to follow and trust. After you get those two things ready, then your conversation is very important. Conversation is not just about talking, right? It's your actions, your behavior. It is your conduct of your life. So today, you really have to examine your conduct in your life. The Bible says, if we look at, go back to our text first, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. As a Christian, you and I, our basis for living is the holiness of God. You and I, our basis is the holiness of God. One thing that we can say is this, though, right? We can't be sinless. We're, we're, we're just human beings, right? But our trait should follow God's trait. And God's trait is what? Holy. And he's sinless. When was the last time you tried to live a holy life? I mean... Sometimes you live each day, and you're like, mm, holiness isn't something I'm going to think about today. Today, I'm going to think about eating. Today, I'm going to think about working. Today, I'm going to think about meeting some people. You know, today, I'm going to think about going to church. You know, some of the things are good. However, when was the last time you thought about being holy? I mean, it's a command. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. If you're not holy, you're disobeying God. Did you ever think about that? And you might be asking, so what does it mean to be holy? You know, don't sin. Simple as that. Stop sinning, and you become more holy. Obviously, you and I know that we can't be sinless. However, you and I are to emulate the trait of God's holiness, something that you and I have to emulate on a daily basis, something that we want to strive for on a daily basis. The greatest Christian ever lived, Apostle Paul, said this, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So what does that tell you? Based on Romans 7, 18, that Apostle Paul sinned, right? the greatest Christian ever lived. He sinned as well. However, his life wasn't characterized by sin. It was characterized by mortifying the deeds of the body, by yielding his members as instruments of righteousness unto God, Romans 6.13, and following Christ. I mean, do you do that? I mean, that should be like our model. I need to mortify the deeds of the body. Because what's gonna, what fruits are you going to bear if, if you don't keep your flesh dead? All the sins, all the sins that you could imagine. 
That's why if you want to live holy, you want to live as sinless as possible. And that's the testimony that you can keep. I don't want to see me or any of you like coming out of a bar. Right? That's not a good testimony. And you might have a good reason. I want to go into the bar and witness to everyone there. You know? People do that. You know, like, and then you come out all smiling. And then people take picture of you with social media. Oh, this, this preacher or this brother or sister goes to Bible-believing church, and they're coming out of the bar smiling. I mean, you might have led someone to the Lord. That's why maybe you're smiling. But to public eyes, they see you as someone who just got drunk, coming out happy. So that is not a good testimony. And it's for whether it's man or woman, right? You don't want to go through, if someone's having a hard time and they call you, you know, hey, preacher, hey, brother, hey, sister, can you come on over? You know, I need some emotional support. You know, I need some biblical doctrine, right? It's like three in the morning. You do not want to go by yourself if it's the opposite sex, right? You just don't know what's going to happen. What if your neighbor sees you coming out of, you know, this, you know, sister's house, three in the morning? Again, you're smiling coming out. Because you, you shared your gospel or you shared your doctrine or, you know, your emotional help. But they take picture, oh, man, there's something going on. That's why you always take somebody. I mean, if you ever have to help someone, like middle of the night, like take your wife with you, take your husband with you. Well, if you're not married, right, take your best buddy or one of the church brethren with you. That's going to protect your testimony. A lot of times people think that they're doing good things, but in essence, you know, they have fallen to the devil, and they're letting devil work in their life. That's, that's why you have to be vigilant. You have to be sober, and you have to think about it. If you were reading the Bible, and if you were close to the Lord, and if you want to live as sinless as you can, all those things will be something that you consider right away. People who fall, people who constantly you know, fall to sin are people who are not close to God. People who think that sinning is something that's inevitable and they just do it and they just be like, okay, I'm a sinner, I just sin, so what? That's not a good attitude. That's not the attitude of someone who wants to live holy life. As you get closer to the Lord, as you have a closer relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, even the littlest sin magnifies itself. For some, little lie is like nothing, right? For some people, like, oh, I'm just going to lie a little bit, right? It's okay. It's not going to hurt anybody. Forgetting that you're actually sinning. But for some who's actually trying to live holy and keep, you know, good testimony, Every little sin magnifies, like, oh, Lord, man, I'm so sorry that I committed that sin. Even though it might be small in the sight of man or not, man, to me, it's huge. You know, I disobeyed you. I committed you know, such a horrible sin against you. Then it just shows. It just tells you one thing. No Christian, nobody in this room, and anybody listening has to sin. You don't have to sin. Why is it that just because you're not perfect, you're inevitable, you know, you're a poor lost sinner, right, that I have to sin or you have to sin? Get that mindset out of your head. That is the mindset of someone who's not going to live holy. I mean, your goal as a Christian is to emulate God and, you know, his trait of holiness but you already have given up. I have to sin. I'm going to sin. There's no, no sin that you need to commit within the next 24 hours. Think about that. Is there any sin 
out there that you need to commit within the next 24 hours? Tell me, raise your hand. You know, let's, let me ask you. See, there's no sin out there where you need to commit within the next 24 hours. Think about it. Then you can live a holy life for a whole day, 24 hours. I mean, when was the last time you ever lived a holy, you know, day? We're not talking about holy week, holy month, holy day. Even for half a day, okay? That's not for too far for some. You know, 24 hours is too much. Let's go half a day. Is there a sin that you have to commit within the next 12 hours? I mean, some of you will be sleeping. So eight, there goes eight hours. So you only have to worry about four hours, right? But some of you might just sleep through the whole 12 hours. Who knows? But the thing is, there's no sin that you have to commit as a Christian. Then think about all the sins that you've been constantly committing lately, past week, past month, year over year. Why do you do it if you don't have to do it? Is it because it's part of your life and it has addicted you? I mean, that's the reason. I mean, sin addiction is real. As people get addicted to drugs, cigarettes, alcohol, you get addicted to sin. And the only way you could stop sinning, the only way you could defeat that addiction is taking it a day at a time. I don't have to do this today. I want to be like the Lord. I want to live holy life. I want to protect my testimony. Okay? So if you're a puffer, then you don't have to puff for the next 24 hours. Right? If you're a shooter, then don't shoot for the next 24 hours. Right? You're like, oh, it's so hard. Of course it's hard. You brought it on yourself. Don't blame me. Don't blame your family. Don't blame the Lord. Don't blame anybody. Always blame yourself that you did this because of you. Then, in order for you to get out of it, you have to take it little by little, little by little. Do you think that someone became holy right out of you know, mother's womb? Never. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody's selfish. But people, after they get saved, they grow little by little, little by little. So in order to protect your testimony with your life, there needs to be growth in your life. There needs to be growth as a Christian. Are you sinning less than yesterday? Are you sinning less than when you got saved? For some, it has been a gradual downhill. You, when you first got saved, you were gung-ho, you tried to live a holy life, you didn't know much about the Bible, but you loved the Lord. So you wanted to sin as little as possible. But as times go by, just like a lot of the marriage or you know, relationships, things get stagnant, things get complacent, there's no love for the Lord. You know, if you love the Lord, you will keep his commandment, right? So if you're not living holy, obviously you don't love the Lord because you're not keeping his commandment. Simple as that. So none of you should say, I love the Lord. Well, you're not loving the Lord because you're not keeping his commandment. Right? Let's be real because your words are just words. It doesn't mean anything if your conversation, if your actions and your heart doesn't show that you love the Lord. Then as you look at your Christian life, think about it. Am I a better Christian? Am I more holy or than the day that I got saved? Or think about the first month when you got saved. I mean, those are, that's like a golden period that you were so happy you got saved. You know, you're saved from hell. Now you're going to heaven. For some, you found the right doctrine along with it, right Bible, right Bible-believing church. And you are so happy, and you have such a love for Lord Jesus Christ. But as time passes by, as time passes by, well, you don't have the same love for Lord Jesus Christ. You don't read the Bible like you should. 
You don't pray like you should. You don't witness like you should. You don't do anything for God like you should. Then what does that mean? Right? You, you left the first love, like the Bible says. On top of that, there's no way you're living a holy life. Your testimony is gone. It's gone. Don't try to you know, shove it in people's face, which are fake, lying lives, right? Don't. You're being unholy to God, and it's not good to cover up your unholiness because of your sake in front of people and your reputation by sacrificing your relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. It's better to be straight. It's better to be upcoming, you know, with Lord Jesus Christ and just get right with the Lord and everything else will just resolve itself. How many times, how many days has it gone by, you know, when you thought about and read about be holy for I am holy? Because it's something that you and I should be thinking about every moment, every day. And try to go harder next time. Go a little longer next time. You say, I want to protect my testimony with my life, and here's a solution. Try not to sin a little longer at a time. A little longer at a time. I, mean, I just give it a simple uh, illustration, right? You know, you got saved, but you have a smoking problem. Like, the Bible says, I can do all things to Christ, which strengthens me. You know, I need to modify the deeds of the body. You remind yourself. But it's super hard. This sin has dragged you for the last 10, 20, even 30 years. So it's not something easy to get rid of, even as a Christian. Then you take it one day at a time, and you try to go a little longer next time, and you become holier. Think about it. Okay, I stopped smoking for 24 hours. I could go a little longer, another 12 hours. Another 12 hours, another 12 hours, another 24 hours. Man, then you could give this testimony. You know, praise the Lord. I've been smoking free for like how long? You know, it has entangled my life for all these years. But why? Because your heart says, I love the Lord. I want to keep his testimonies. And I want to go longer and longer, a little longer, so that I could stop sinning. Less and less and less. Then, what do you think is going to happen in your life? As you live more holy, you're going to get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have more love for the lost souls out there because you keep commandment. And people are going to actually look at your life, and it's a great testimony. Man, I see that brother. I see that sister. I want to have what they have. Wouldn't you be great? Wouldn't it be the best in heaven? You see some unknown faces come up to you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Because of your testimony, because of your holy living, I got saved. I wanted to know more about Jesus Christ. There shouldn't be any excuse whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're strong, whether you're weak. You and I need to protect our testimony with our life. Let's pray. Dear Father, you have given us your life, Lord, with your precious blood and saved us from hell. And you have given us the perfect word of God and the right teachings and right doctrines, Lord. However, we live our days and lives without any purpose. We just live a complacent, indifferent life, Lord God not caring about what you think, Lord. Help us to get right with you, Lord. Help us to confess our sins, Lord, and really, truly understand what you said in the Word of God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And help us to live a holy life, keeping our testimony, just taking it one day at a time, Lord, and taking it longer and longer each time. And Lord God, we pray for our pastors, you know, thank you that you know, all the arrangement has been set well for Pastor Cash Shrive. Pray that you'll bless the service. We will Pastor Mike Shrive, you know, continue to heal him and those anyone else, you know, who's you know, going through 
health issues or even life's issues, Lord, be with them. And Lord God, we can't wait for you to come back, Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus. In just name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>